Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. Now, I thought I'd start off uh, a quick shout out to my good friend Michele for giving me this absolutely gorgeous book on Vacheron Constantine, which we'll be discussing in today's video. Before I get into this video, I just want to show you something, and I'm yes, I'm using a <laughs> NATO strap as a bookmark. Here it is. Now, this is the reference 57260, and it is the world's most complicated pocket watch. I, I believe it has 57 complications. Incredible. It's the ultimate masterpiece in uh, watchmaking. I think it came out in about 2015. It's a big beast of a pocket watch, but it is an absolute marvel to behold. And you can see little complications hidden, you know, multiple hands there and just incredible. Look at that tourbillon there. I mean, everything, everything is there. Anyway, guys, I thought I'd start with it, something extra special. Let's roll the intro and get into today's video. Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. Now today, I'm gonna to be sharing my top 10 brands that I feel are the most underappreciated and offer so much that, that they really deserve to have a little bit more attention um, given to them. My wristwatch check today is actually in honor of this video because it is a brand that I feel uh, well, I, I wasn't aware of until I found out about this very unique uh, version or interpretation of the Rattrapante. Now I am of course talking about Dubai and Sheldon brand. They are a luxury Swiss watchmaker dating back not, not that far but from the 1940s. I have done a video all about this watch and that is my first pick of the brands today. This is based on a Landeron movement uh, so it's got a really nice loud tick to it, very satisfying. Uh, the case is done in this very late 1940s style with this Art Deco lugs. I absolutely adore it. I managed to pick one up. It's it's a really great affordable way to get a Rattrapante chronograph without breaking the bank because it certainly is uh, a complication associated with more kind of higher end watchmaking. Dubai and Chandelbrand are still going to this day, although under new ownership, because I think uh, unfortunately uh, the original founders Dubai and Chandelbrand have passed away. However, you can still pick them up for an absolute bargain on the used market. Now the newer watches are dramatically different. They've gone into a kind of super luxury, uh, uh, limited amount of, of watches made away from the classic beautiful timepieces that uh, they used to make. That's my first pick of the bunch. So let's move on to a big boy brand, one of the holy trinity and I'm not exactly sure uh, where this term came about. I think it was started on the early days of the internet. Now the holy trinity refers to the top three Swiss horterology uh, watchmakers. So it's Patek, Adumar Piguet and of course my pick of the bunch, Vacheron Constantine. Mainly because, well, they're the oldest. They were founded in 1755, Patek in comparison in 1839, and AP a little bit later in 1875. Now they are part of the Richemont group these days, but what I love about Vacheron is that they just have such a rich heritage to them. And what the book really beautifully illustrates is that rich heritage, but also this obsession with making the best their main goal was always to be the most refined. Vacheron Constantine's motto ever since the early days, and let me quote this because I've, I've got to get it right. Do better if possible, and that is always possible. There was even a, a hidden lady's watch in a Fabergé egg. Past owners include Napoleon Bonaparte, who used to buy it for the women in his life. I mean, uh, Napoleon's been famous as a, as a, I think he owned a Breguet himself, but it's very telling what a man buys for the important women in his life, because it just shows you that 
You know, he wanted to buy them something refined, something luxurious. Pope Pius VI was an owner, King Edward VIII another one, and of course Harry Truman. So it's always been something, um, in a way, it's, it was the, the first real luxury or super luxury brand before, you know, luxury became marketing, you know, it was, it was an integral part of the philosophy of, of Vacheron Constantine. And the great thing is, on the current market, you can pick up Vacherons for not really that much, in comparison to Patek and AP, certainly. I've seen beautiful mid-century slim little dress watches go for about four or five grand in a precious metal uh, on the used market. Um, so do have a look. Think of it like this. If AP and Patek are new money, Vacheron is that old, old money. You know, it's got that, that old money feel about it. I adore Vacheron and if I had to buy something from the Holy Trinity, it would be VC all the way, absolutely all the way. So anyway, let's move on next. My next brand is uh, and my third choice is Galet and Co. Now Galet and Co. is actually the world's oldest watch and clock maker, and they've been going since 1466. This is of course a Swiss uh, Geneva-based company, and they're still going to this day. Amazingly, that alone gets them in this list. You know, it's just incredible, mind-blowing. Just, just you know, let's say that date again: 1466. Amazing, amazing. It's still a relatively small company, best known for their chronographs, but not only are they the oldest uh, watch and clock maker in the world, they also have an incredible amount of firsts to their name. They had the first wristwatch that beat faster than 28,800 vibrations an hour. The Racine Quick Train in 1928. They had the first timepiece designed specifically for yacht racing. That was the Galley Yachting Timer in 1915. They also produced the first chronograph uh, multiple time zone calculator. That was the Galley Flight Officer and that was in 1939. They had the first wristwatch with rotating bezel. Actually, that was the same watch as the um, multiple time zones. They had the first miniature chronograph wristwatch for women. They had the first chronograph wristwatch with an additional 24-hour GMT hand. Now, this was the Galley Multicron Navigator in 1945. They also had the first waterproof stopwatch in 1945. And lastly, the first 24-hour reading chronograph. This was the Galley Multicron 24-hour uh, in 1947. Amazing. And guys, if I read out all the awards, uh, all the recognition, uh, medals, uh, it's, you know, I would be here. We could do a whole video on Galley and it would probably be several <laughs> hours long. Um, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna let that soak into your head and then um, move on to the next brand. So incredible, incredible. Number four, Zodiac Watches. And this is kind of funny because I literally just watched, uh, I think, is it David Finch? I think it's David Finch's movie about the Zodiac killer in San Francisco. And the watch does feature heavily in that movie. Zodiac is a Swiss manufacturer founded in 1882 in Le Cure, Switzerland. Now they're part of the Fossil Group. Zodiac are mostly known for their historic Seawolf line of dive watches. Now this was slightly different to, to the dive watches of its day and this was released in 1953 because it was the first dive watch aimed at the masses, not just divers. Now of course these days dive watches are all the rage and it's perfectly normal but back then it, this was actually aimed or marketed and produced for civilian or, or, or the mainstream, which was very ahead of its time. And, and you really got to respect Zodiac for, for this kind of, um, you know, thinking outside the box. Now, I believe it was the Sea Wolf that were featured in the Zodiac film. I'm not 100% sure about that. I'll have to double check and maybe I'll um, include it in one of my uh, movies for Watch Lovers uh, series. Uh, videos. Anyway, now in 2015, Zodiac reissued some of their classic Seawolf watches, updating them, 
and I think they're gorgeous. My pick of the bunch is their vintage options, especially the, uh, the you can get a world timer with a GMT hand, very similar aesthetic to the Sea Wolf, and I've seen them go for you know under or around the thousand dollars on the used market. I adore Zodiac, especially the vintage options. Some of their designs are very playful, fun, and something a little bit different. And that's what I love about my Dubai and Shalda brand is nobody knows what this is. I mean, unless you're a serious, serious horologist, you know what an index mobile Rattrapante is. And I feel the same way about Zodiac's watches. There's, they're the kind of enthusiast insider brands. I mean, all of these are. Okay, moving on to number five, and it's gotta be Roger W. Smith. Now, Roger W. Smith is a very small, super high-end, independent British watchmaker. And he was the apprentice to George Daniels, the inventor, of course, of the coaxial escapement uh, that Omega then took and you know developed into the uh, the coaxial movements we see in their contemporary offerings. Now, there's good reason why they're not very well known. First of all, they only make a very limited amount of watches per year, and we're talking super high-end, handmade, handcrafted, beautiful, super luxury. It's very much bespoke, um, so you know, hence, <laughs> hence why you probably haven't heard of them. I got introduced to this brand a few years ago. I, I heard a documentary, not a documentary, actually it was a, a program about business on uh, BBC Radio 4, and they were talking about Roger Smith. It's not until later that I that I got a, um, the coaxial Seamaster that then I found out about um, George Daniels and the, and the, the um, coaxial escapement and blah 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 and then I you know connected the dots. I'm never gonna be able to afford one. I think they go for you know as much as $250,000. I mean it's really high-end but they make staggeringly beautiful exquisite timepieces very much in the British style, and they kind of remind me of uh, my grandfather's Frodsham, for example. There, there is a, a very definitive British style that you can see. I don't know if it's in detention, well, probably it is. When we look at German watches like Lange and, and Glashütte Original and all the rest of them, they definitely have a Germanic style. Well, Roger Smith very much is in that British style. They've only been going since 2001, I, I believe since uh, George Daniels passed away. Now they're based in the Isle of Man and they're still going strong to this day. Roger Smith has won countless awards, the Barrett Silver Medal from the British Horological Institute for outstanding development and achievement in the field of horology. And these watches are still very much faithful to what Roger, uh, in the interview I, I heard, described as the George Daniels method. Now, if I recall correctly, there is a documentary called The Watchmaker's Apprentice about George Daniels and Roger Smith. I haven't seen it. I think I'm gonna eBay it and watch it, but it was recommended by a few members of the gentry, so um, it, it's, it's fascinating. Okay, so number six. It's got to be the Ball Watch Company. Now, I have reviewed two of their watches and I was really, really impressed both times. They originally were an American company. Now they're based in Le Champ de Fonds in Switzerland. What makes Ball so unique is that they were crucial in the development of the American railroad system. What happened was there was a quite notorious crash of two trains because America's so big, when you cross time zones, literally going across the country in these trains, time schedules got mixed up and, you know, lo and behold, a crash happened. There was such a high loss of life in this, in this uh, crash, in this train crash, that they decided to have a standardized time for the entire uh, rail network. Now, this was in the late 1800s. Now, Ball had already established themselves as a producer and manufacturer of very precise and reliable time-keeping uh, devices, primarily uh, pocket watches at the time. So they were selected for what's called the RR standard. It's a little bit like chronometer certification of accuracy, of robustness, the movements had to be made a certain way, 
blah blah blah. You can still see it, they use it on the balance of a lot of their, on the seconds hand, you'll see the double R and that's what that refers to. So it's a, a very unique that is unlike any other watch company out there and I, I really do feel Ball offer such quality and that's, that's why I still rate them highly. It impressed me in both times, especially the, the, the Skin Diver, an incredible watch for the money. The way they use uh, tritium. Uh, the little tritium gas tubes for luminescence on all their watches. They also have very unique designs. They're incredibly well made. They're very honestly nipping at the heels of the luxury big boys. They really are. I feel they just don't get enough attention. Their watches are almost over-designed or over-engineered, but in a good way. And they still have that attention to detail and... Um, kind of quest for robustness and reliability and precision that they were famed for. Okay, moving on to something a little bit more affordable. At number seven, it's got to be the Casio Edifice. Now, I have actually got one. Hold on a second. Here we go. Now, this piece, I'm, I'm due to review it. This is an incredible watch. I mean, really feature-rich, and that is what Casio Edifice have to offer. It's like a subsidiary of Casio, but a little bit higher end, if you imagine. While they are very affordable, I picked this one up for only $100. Staggering when you consider the amount of technology it has in it, very, very highly advanced. Basically, it's analog watches or any digi watches from Casio, but they utilize the best cutting edge technology that Casio have to offer. So we got things like the wave scepter technology that gives them synchronization to atomic clocks via radio waves. We get Tough Solar, which is another Casio um, very innovative and a robust form of, of, of solar power that some of their watches have a 10-year battery life. I mean, just incredible stuff. So I really recommend having a look at the Casio Edifice range. I will be reviewing this at some point. Please forgive me. Is, is the problem is, is that I, I have too many watches to review. Sometimes I have to put some on the back burner and then, you know, because others are more time sensitive because I have people sending in watches uh, and I want to return them. Um, so I, I, will, I will get to review it, but have a look at Casio Edifice. Uh, they also, I believe they, they sponsor, is it the Red Bull team in Formula One? Very cool stuff. And this watch, it will, I think every 24 hours, it will recalibrate itself. Even if it's off by, you know, a split second, it will, <laughs> it will correct itself. Um, not only that, it has one hundredth of a second chronograph. Phenomenal, phenomenal technology and amazing to think you can get it for as little as, um, you know, a hundred bucks. So is it any wonder that Casio Edifice is in there? Okay, moving on. Number eight, Gerard Perigo. Now this is a high-end elite Swiss brand from Le Champ de Fonds, founded in 1791, so very, very old. Well, first of all, they have an incredible wide range, dress watches, you name it. They are probably one of the most affordable ways of getting into horology. Uh, they have an extremely long tradition of making in-house movements. They offer everything from chronographs, annual calendars, minute repeaters, tri-axial tourbillons, and of course, their latest innovation, which is the constant escapement. Now, this was first presented in 2013. Basically, what the constant escapement is, it's their answer to the waning power in traditional mechanical watches. So a key component of this is a completely new designed escapement that is buckled with a silicon blade thinner than a human hair, and it acts as a, um, a kind of energy micro storage unit, delivering constant impulses to the balance wheel. Uh, very ingenious, and, and just goes to show that Gerard Perigo are still innovating to this day. Now, the reason I put them in this list, well, it's fairly obvious, they have an incredible history, 
But most importantly, they have bargains on the used market. Gerard Perigo are highly underpriced, in my opinion, and they don't get mentioned enough. So, I, you know, I had to include them. It's a brand we'll come back to and hopefully we'll, we'll review at some time in the future. Okay, moving on to number, what is this? Number nine, Satina. Yes, finally, I, I, I talk about Satina. Now, they were founded in 1888. Uh, in Gretchen in Switzerland. They are part of the Swatch Group now. They have incredibly long history and list of achievements. And they're still going strong to this day, still relatively affordable. Now, way back in the early days of wristwatches, men still preferred pocket watches. I know it's, it's strange to believe this, but it was still very much the trend to have a pocket watch the early wristwatches were more for women. It's funny because it's kind of, it's, it's reverse now, especially if you look at my analytics, it's, you know, 95% men that, <laughs> that watch the channel. And Satina were one of the first watch brands to start aiming their wristwatches more towards the men or market it towards the, the male consumer. A second major achievement for Satina was in 1936, they were the first company to produce a digital watch. It was driven by a spring movement and rotating discs bearing inscribed numbers used to display the time instead of hands. Way ahead of their time and this is 1936. Satina's crowning achievement is the DS or what is called the double security line released in 1959. Now what this is was a concept of suspending the watch movement inside a highly reinforced case and this was called the DS, uh, short for double security. This enabled the Satina watches to be uh, more shock resistant and higher in their water resistance rating. Uh, very similar thinking to actually the, the, um, the G-Shock, although this is obviously for, mechanical, uh, for a mechanical timepiece. Not only that, they were the first to produce a watch that was scratch resistant, completely made out of tungsten carbide. I think it was the DS Dia Master. Very, very cool. So as you can see, they have a long tradition of making, you know, really hard as nails watches. Now, if you look at the logo of Satina, it's of the shell of a tortoise. Now this is in reference to this uh, achievement. So Satina were more aimed at making tough, robust uh, watches and they still do make incredible watches to this day, hugely underrated. I've only handled a few, I think it was the Action Diver and I remember being very, very impressed by its ruggedness and it's just this rock solid feel it had. They have some really tastefully done, clean designs. They have a day date that I really like. Uh, the Powermatic 80 is very impressive. What else? What else? They have a few. Oh, and not to mention their vintage offerings. I saw a, a Satina, beautiful mid-century, ultra thin, manual wind for about a couple of hundred dollars on the used market. Um, beautiful vintage pieces. So it's a brand you can really be proud of with a great history. Okay, so that was number nine. Last, but by no means least, my personal favorite of the bunch, it is of course Fortis. Now guys, have a look back. I did review their most iconic watch, the Fortis official cosmonauts chronograph, which was selected by the Russian Federal Space Agency as their watch of choice and is still worn to this day on the International Space Station. Now they were founded in 1912 in Gretchen in Switzerland. They're still based there to this day, still independent and still making incredible watches. And guys, if you're not aware about Fortis, you really need to learn about them, especially horologists, serious horologists will appreciate this. They were actually the very first company to make and release the first self-winding wristwatch. Now this was all the way back in 1926. It was a partnership with the inventor of the first automatic wristwatch, John Harwood. Uh, so incredible importance to the history of horology. I mean, it's undeniable. Not only that, they were the first company in the world to make waterproof wristwatch. And this of course was the Fortissimo. Now I went into the history of this amazing company 
in my review of the, uh, the Cosmonaut Chronograph, I do urge you to have a look back. I'll leave a link in the description and all of that. I feel that, uh, especially as an independent brand, they offer so much to this very day. And are one of my favorite, uh, com I'm, I'm strongly considering getting the 40s. Let's, let's just say that. What I love about them is they offer such quality, a rich heritage of innovation. Um, their, their, their watches are so well designed. I mean, the, the, the Cosmonaut Chronograph was, is just the epitome of a, a tool chronograph. But the thing that is most admirable and what I respect about the brand is they haven't got pretentious prices. They're realistic. In an industry that there are brands out there charging exorbitant amounts for their watches, with Fortis you get exactly what you pay for. They're so unpretentious beautifully made, incredible quality to a luxury standard, and I really do mean that. Extremely hard to beat, and for me, they're the most underappreciated watch brand out there. And in fact, I'm gonna get some, hopefully, more Fortis watches in soon, uh, and do some more reviews, because I feel they need to be talked about. More people should know about this brand. They have so much to offer, it really is incredible. Anyway, guys, that is my top 10. You know, <laughs> we barely scratched the surface. I mean, there's so much out there. I was very tempted. Had this been a top 20, there would have been, you know, Ulysses Nadin, Smiths is another one, Hanhart, Vulcane is another one. I mean, the, the, the list is endless. Anyway, guys, please do nominate your favorite brands or underappreciated favorite brands in the comments below. What brands do you feel don't get enough attention, that offer a lot more than people realize, and that brands that people need to know more about, please do share in the comments below. Thank you very, very much for watching. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it, found it useful, and as always, guys, I will catch you in the next one. Okay, ciao.